Okay, so the endosymbiotic process. And um, so anyway, um, these internal structures like mitochondria and chloroplasts were acquired to form prokaryotes via the endosymbiotic process. So we talked about how um, the acquisition of mitochondria could give this <clears throat> primitive type of eukaryote an advantage over those that didn't have it. And then the acquisition a little later in time in some of them of the uh, of essentially a photosynthetic prokaryote to give rise to photosynthetic eukaryotes would have given them an advantage because now they can make their own food. Um, now it's assumed that in this series of events the acquisition of the mitochondrion came first and I'll leave it at that and you can think about why that is and in class we'll discuss about why we're pretty sure that's the way in which it happened. Um, this idea of endosymbiosis was first, uh, well, was an early proponent of it was Lynn Margulis, a microbiologist. And at first people thought, eh, that's kind of crazy, but it's um, become an idea that is pretty much accepted as the way in which prokaryotes came about. Multicellularity, a little over one and a half billion years ago. Um, here's one hypothesis as to how that would have come about. You've had a unicellular. Um, eukaryote, they begin to live in aggregations. Given they have some advantage to doing this in terms of perhaps protection or food acquisition. And starting to form a more complex structure, ultimately getting specialization of some of these cells for jobs like perhaps digestion or reproduction, and greater complexity <coughs> leading towards more complex multicellular organisms. <coughs> Excuse me, and of course, giving rise to fungi, ultimately to fungi, plants, and animals from these first single celled uh, protist, multicellular protist, etc. Volvox is an extant uh, example of exhibiting some sort of one of these intermediate stages. It's a type of colonial algae that has cells that are very similar, uh, that clump together. But then you have some of the cells that specialize in reproduction. We can see those on the inside. Um, all right, a little later. So, of course, a little over, I don't know, half a billion years ago, you get animals arising. And there was a particular period in time when you had a rapid diversification of these mammals. Oh, man, not mammals, but animals. And this is known as the Cambrian Explosion, in which many of today's forms of animal, many of today's animal phyla first came about. Um, and so in a, in the, at least in the geological sense, over a very short period of time, you had rapid evolution of animals. Again, the Cambrian explosion. Colonization of land, we talked about oxygen earlier, and how when you had oxygen in the atmosphere, this changed the atmosphere significantly. In particular, now you get the development of an ozone layer. Whoops which blocks out ultraviolet light, thus making the land more inhabitable. And so um, photosynthetic organisms and animals begin to start making use of this new habitat. All right, things that have impacted life over time and promoted the diversification, speciation, and extinction of things. Of course, um, we know that the, the Earth's surface, the crust, the solid material floats on the mantle, essentially liquefied rock, um, heated up by the heat generated by the Earth's core. And so that crust is divided into plates. And the science of plate tectonics tells us that these plates move uh, around. They come apart. They come together. Um, they slide past each other, like we see in Southern California. And so this has caused um, the continents to move around. And in Earth's past, there have been, they've all been sort of jammed together into a supercontinent. And other times, they've drifted apart. And so this has impacted the life on them. Um, so for example, they came together about 250 million years ago. 
And this resulted, we think, in one of these mass extinctions. Essentially, when they came together, it really decreased the amount of coastline that was there and impacted aquatic organisms. But then as they drifted apart, that created more coastline and allowed for diversification of forms, for example. When, uh, you know, at one time Africa and South America were together in one continent, and of course there would have been the ability for organisms to move around on them, but then as they became separated, and now of course you have this significant barrier between them, and that has allowed for the plants and animals and other organisms on Africa and South America to take different evolutionary trajectories, leading to um, greater diversification. <coughs> So, um, so when we look at this, the blue line is number of families, um, the red line is extinction rate. So there are periods of extinction, but then following extinctions, you usually have some diversification. So that overall through time, diversity has increased, but we've had some periods when that diversity has decreased, but then rebounded. It's thought that we are perhaps in... Um, another period of <clears throat> relatively large extinction, perhaps due to, to human activities. When you look at the relationship between the Earth's temperature and extinction rate, we see that in of these five, one, two, three, four, five mass extinctions, that four of the five have occurred in time periods when the Earth is relatively warmer compared to today, zero represents the baseline of today, one of them when it was cooler, but these three in particular when it was Earth was much warmer than it is now, it's thought now that the Earth is warming up and so that this might in part promote a change in climate which can increase extinction rate. But as I said, when these mass extinctions occurs, they are followed by because there's fewer species, this opens up space for the remaining species and you get this rapid, what we would call um, adaptive radiation in which the remaining organisms spread out into those new habitats and diversify adaptive radiation. And so mammals are a good example of this. Um, with the demise of the dinosaur, dinosaurs, that presumably opened up lots of niche space out there in the environment for mammals to spread and diversify. All right, sections five and six. Think other things that have impacted evolution. Of course, when we look at genetics, there are genes that control development, and they have evolved over time. Um, one phenomenon we see is what's called heterochrony, and that is changes in the timing, the rate and timing of development. So a good example is when we look at humans and chimps, we share a common ancestor and are closely related but we develop in different ways. So when you look, for example, at the skull of a baby chimp and a baby human, they're very similar. But essentially, in chimps, you get certain parts growing more than other parts. Um, so uh, when you look at this baby chimp, it has a relatively flat face, but an adult chimp does not. They have a much more developed muzzle, and so that part of their skull grows much more than ours, or, or you might say ours through time, the growth of it has slowed, and this change is what's known as heterochrony. So um, there's a different rate of development in us and chimps, and that's Again, that we call heterochrony. We see this in the overall um, um, growth form of, of a person. So when a baby is born, and obviously these are not the scale, but it's to show you the relative proportion. So when a baby is born, their head is much larger relative to the rest of their body size than when they are an adult. So as an example of heterochrony, what we're saying is that, of course, all parts of your body grow as you go from being a baby to being an adult, but some parts grow more than other. So while your head grows, it does not grow to the same extent as your trunk and your limbs. They become, they grow at a faster rate, relatively speaking, such that by the time you're an adult, the head makes up a smaller proportion of your overall body size compared to when 
you're a baby. Now, heterochrony can result in what we call pedamorphosis, and pedamorphosis is when um, reproductive organisms in one species proceeds faster than in a related species. So, for example, here, this is a type of um, salamander here that becomes an adult, that is, its reproductive organisms develop at a faster rate, and so it becomes an adult at a stage which other salamanders are still in a juvenile stage. So it, as an adult, it has these external gills. It lives in water. And this is essentially, its adult stage is where other salamanders are when they're juveniles. And so it exhibits what we call pedamorphosis. It's retaining juvenile characteristics like the gills and an aquatic existence in an adult. Homeotic genes, these are genes that control development in uh, growth and development in animals, and so evolution of these through time has caused diversification in the evolutionary process. So um, we can see that um, there are certain genes that promote the development of limbs or not, and so in a um, chicken, for example, they have wings and legs, which you don't see in snakes, the snake on this side. And so the snake, these genes are not active, whereas the development of limbs in the chicken is due to genes that are activated in them. These homeotic genes have evolved in different ways. A subset of homeotic genes are known as Hox genes. And again, they develop, they control development and the growth of limbs. And so here we have... Um, um, a fly and a type of brine shrimp, what are sometimes called sea monkeys, you may have heard that. And so they have limbs, but these hox genes have evolved in a way such that you'll get the development of fewer limbs and more limbs in flies versus brine shrimp. Um, so these, the evolution of these hox genes is really provided for a diversification of body form, um, particularly in animals. Now, uh, is evolution goal-oriented? Well, um, in other word, no. Um, evolution doesn't really have a goal towards a particular type of organism. It's just that particular types develop through the evolutionary process due to having characteristics that at any moment in time help them in surviving that. Um, allow them to be well adapted to their environment. So we might look at the eye that we have, and it's a relatively complex structure, and say, oh, well, evolution, the goal of evolution was to produce that eye. Well, no, an evolutionary biologist would say that structure has developed, again, over time, because through time there were changes in it that, again, at that moment in time were adaptive, leading to this complex structure. So these these show types of visual uh, organs that you see in different types of animals that are alive today, and they show what we think is sort of the intermediate steps that gave rise to the eye. So some things just have sort of a cluster of pigmented cells on their skin that allow them to sense light. Others sort of fold that in, which helps to concentrate the light that gets in there. Others have essentially added a fluid-filled cavity, which acts as a lens. Um, and then, again, others have started to give it greater and greater complexity. Um, and so now we have one where we have muscles that are attached to that lens and allow you to move the lens and adjust the focus. Um, again, there's that cup-like structure, which helps to focus the light in there. A retina that can see colors and black and white. Um, And so uh, if we look at the genus Equus, if we look at horses, you, you could say, well, or the goal of evolution was to produce a horse. Well, no, horses just happen to have developed through a series of steps. And so the yellow bars represent these, eight, these extinct species that gave rise, as far as we can tell, to horses. And then the other ones represent extinct species that were sort of side branches, if you will. Well, 
as someone like um, Richard Dawkins would say, if you rewound evolution and started it over again somewhere in the past, there's no reason to suspect that, you know, 